Okay, that, that brings me on then. So to our, our next presentation, um, bed bugs. Blimey, yeah, it feels like it's been a while since we've talked about bed bugs, but really important subject. So yeah, Sarah, it'd be fantastic to, to hear what you have, have for us today. Awesome, thanks, Natalie. Good, Good morning. morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Sarah Layton. I work for a company um, called Transform, formerly known as Bedbug Central. Some of you may have heard uh, my colleague Jeff White speak sometime over the years. I am the Training and Quality Assurance Coordinator, um, and I am currently giving this presentation out of the States. I am in New Jersey, so I am trying to be as upbeat and bubbly as possible, but it is definitely earlier for me than even for the rest of you. So today we are going to talk about um, our approach to manage bed bugs. This is a, um, it's called the no prep bed bug approach. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit of um, history and the resurgence of bed bugs, the biology and behavior of bed bugs. These kind of background topics we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but they're important to understand how we get into our best treatment methods and why um, the no prep methodology works. We're going to be talking about how to identify an infestation, the use of monitors when it comes to bed bugs. Then we're going to get into no prep and recommended modes of treatment. So, like I said, we want to start out with a brief history and resurgence of bed bugs because, you know, this one to me is just really interesting. Um, this is a postcard that's dated 1916 um, and it was called or labeled the war on bed bug on the bed bug and I found this in a textbook that came out a few years ago a bed bug a bed bug management textbook and I just found this super fascinating because this really shows us that we've had you know a long and storied history when it comes to bed bugs now um, right after World War II, with the use of DDT and other broad spectrum pesticides, we saw a pretty much eradication of bed bugs, both in the States and over um, in Europe and in the UK. So um, this is something where people really didn't know what bed bugs were when the bed bug resurgence happened. For us, it was around the year 2000. For you guys, it was um, a few years later, somewhere around 2010, 2015. So we've definitely been dealing with this resurgence about longer than you have. Um, so hopefully you can learn from everything that we have done over the last few years. And this is also why learning history um, and why the resurgence happened is important um, because we need to know all of those things we've learned over the last 20 years and apply them to the control methods that we're going to use. Um, a lot of things that companies are still doing for bed bug control is what companies were doing back when the resurgence happened in 2000 um, and those subs subsequent years. But what we know is that we've learned a lot over the last 20 years about bed bugs. Unfortunately, we had that long hiatus, that long break of time where we didn't really know anything about bed bugs because we were lucky enough that they weren't really around. But now we have learned a lot over the last 20 years, and this is what we want to use to apply to their control. So why did bed bugs come back? What happened with the resurgence? You know, like I mentioned, they've been around for as long as, as long as, you know, written history goes back, there are references to bed bugs in, you know, the Bible, um, in cave drawings, and we are pretty much their favorite hosts. They will go wherever we go. So when it came to the resurgence, um, it was really due to the movement of people. Um, eradication of bed bugs happened in the United States and in Europe and in some other countries. Um, but it didn't happen around the globe. So as people started moving more, globalization of products, globalization of people, increased travel, bed bugs just started moving. That was really just a natural um, path that they were going to have. They move both passively and actively. We're going to talk about their active movement, how they move themselves around. But when it comes to bed bugs, people really think um, of hotels. They think hotels are, you know, the bad thing that's out there. But when we think of bed bugs, from our perspective, we think of everything from um, subway systems or underground systems, flying on airplanes, 
reused furniture. Um, this is very popular in the States, whether you're going antique shopping or you just find a couch out on the curb and, hey, that couch looks pretty good. I think I can use that couch in my living room. This is actually one of the bigger reasons we think that bed bugs move around is actually reused furniture. Somebody got rid of that couch for a reason, probably, and now you're just bringing that infestation back into um, your home. And like I mentioned, that antique shopping, um, whether it is, you know, a couch, a chair, a bed frame, or something like a nightstand or a dresser that was infested and nobody caught that when it went into that um, antique store. So like I mentioned, the bed bug resurgence really didn't happen in the UK um, until the last five or so years, but it has been in the United States since 2000. Um, but when it came to COVID, we saw a drastic, drastic decrease in bed bug services, um, both anecdotally from us asking around the industry and also from our own sales of our bed bug products. Um, you know, bed bugs function similar to a virus. They, mo it, they move around when people are moving around. So if people are sheltered in place, if people are not moving, uh, people aren't going to work, they're not taking the subway, they're not uh, traveling, then bed bugs are not going to be moving around as much. And so we really saw a decrease in bed bug infestations in the United States. We also know that in the US, we have different areas that have lots of bed bugs and different areas that have not so many bed bugs. And it doesn't always coincide with where we see lots of people. A city like Miami, which is in Florida, which is in the Southeast of the United States, they don't really see a whole lot of bed bugs, despite being a huge tourist destination, warm weather, you'd think that would be the perfect place for bed bugs. But somewhere on the complete opposite of the United States, which would be Alaska, where they really don't have a whole lot of people, they do have a huge bed bug infestation problem. Now, like I said, with COVID, some of these numbers are a little wonky. They're changing a little bit. We still need to see what that picture is going to look like. But similar to what you had, there's been you know, no travel, students have been at home, and we have definitely seen a decrease in bed bug numbers. I'd be curious to know what you are all seeing over, um, over on your side of the Atlantic as well. And so we know how bed bugs move, we know who they wanna be with, and this really gets us into their biology and behavior. So bed bugs, Cymex lectularius, this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about bat bugs. We are not talking about um, the tropical bed bug, which I don't believe you guys would have quite yet. Um, as they are in tropical areas, still very warm weather pest. So this is a bed bug. For those of you that have never seen one, if you um, have not gotten into bed bug work yet, they are wingless. They are reddish brown in color, oval. They're flat. This helps them get into all those small cracks and crevices and get into um, those small places in your furniture. And when we tell people sizes of bed bugs, we tell them to think of an apple seed. This isn't always the best comparison for all different stages of bed bugs, but it's a pretty good comparison for people that have never seen them because a lot of people think they are microscopic and they think, you know, I'm getting bit, I must have bed bugs, but they haven't seen anything. So really we use this comparison to say they are visible to the human eye at all stages. And when it comes to adults, they really do look very similar to an apple seed. Similar size, similar shape, similar color. So why have bed bugs been plaguing humans for you know, the last few thousands of years? Well, unlike mosquitoes and fleas, bed bugs only feed on blood at all of their developmental stages. And it's whether they are male or female. There's lots of insects out there that males do not need a blood meal. Blood meal. Females need one um, to produce those eggs. Bed bugs, this, this isn't the case for them. They might also feed on dogs, cats, rabbits, birds, if there's another animal in the home that's easy access for them. But for the most part, we are, you know, really their favorite host. They are attracted to three things. 
carbon dioxide. This is number one. This is the primary attractant that we have um, or that bed bugs have towards us. They, you know, sense our carbon dioxide that we are exhaling and that gets them moving. That's what they're looking for. Secondarily, they will orient themselves using heat. So, you know, we give off body heat. Initially, they sense that carbon dioxide, and then they start orienting themselves towards heat and our body odor. So the chemicals that we have um, on our skin. And one thing we want to point out on this slide is bed bug infestations have been shown, unfortunately, to reservoir in underserved and transient communities because these places typically just don't have great pest control. And because of the nature of these areas, right? Transient populations, people are moving around a lot in, out. Um, it's really hard to control bed bugs when people are moving around a lot. But this really is just meant to say that bed bugs can be found anywhere. They are, while they might reservoir in lower income and lower socioeconomic areas, they can happen to everyone. Bed bugs don't care how much money you make. They don't care where you live. Um, all they care about is that blood meal. When it comes to bed bug bites, um, there's a typical bed bug bite that some people get. Um, they happen typically on exposed skin surfaces and you'll see them in rows and clusters. Many of us are probably familiar with that. But at the end of the day, everyone reacts differently. Um, some people don't react at all. Some people have a super delayed reaction. Myself, this is actually my arm. Um, I tested a bed bug on myself, I'm sure. Quite a few of us in the audience probably have done this as well. When you work with bed bugs, you want to know what your bite looks like. And my bite takes 10 to 12 days to show up and is not itchy and not bothersome at all when it does. So this is really just to tell you, um, you never want to diagnose a bed bug infestation by bites alone. If you have a customer that's calling and complaining about um, being bit, this will lead us into an inspection but we don't want to sell pest control. We don't want to perform a service based on bites alone. Now, one thing that bed bugs don't do is transmit disease. This is probably the only good thing that they don't do, right? Um, but they are an emotional experience. Think about if you don't feel comfortable sleeping in your own bed at night. People experience the same symptoms as PTSD, you know, you deal with sleeplessness, insomnia. This all leads into trouble concentrating at work, trouble in your day to day, trouble when you're awake. So this is really just kind of my um, my PSA to say, you know, remember to be empathetic with your customers. Yes, bed bugs aren't transmitting diseases, but just think how you would feel for those of you that had never had bed bugs. Lucky for me, I have not had an infestation at my home, but you know, just imagine how you would feel if something is kind of violating you and attacking you each night in your sleep. So we've talked about biology and behavior of bed bugs, and this is going to get us into how to identify an infestation. As I mentioned at the top, understanding bed bugs will help us when it comes to control and will help us when it comes to um, prevention or being proactive. We can't really prevent bed bugs because they move around on their own and they move around because of us, but we can be proactive with um, our bed bug control and our bed bug inspections. So when it comes to identifying a bed bug infestation, one thing to know is that bed bugs are predictable. They are going to be associated with anywhere that people sleep, which, you know, hence the term bed bug, but it is not uncommon to find them in other areas as well. It's going to really depend on where people are spending a lot of time. Um, you should always be doing an inspection visual inspection. Um, maybe you are using canine inspection, but you should always be doing an inspection, but it helps to know your, your customers, you know, their history and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis when they are home. Does somebody sleep in a recliner? Does somebody sleep on their couch at night while they watch TV? If people are spending a lot of time in their living room or in their office, especially now that more and more people are working from home for longer stretches of time, these are going to be more likely places that bed bugs are gonna be found than say the bed. So bed bugs typically are going to just be found where people are spending a lot of time. So we have a long list here. 
beds, couches, recliners, a common room if we're talking about um, you know, an entire property of multiple units, wheelchairs. This is also a big thing that people forget when they are servicing a home. Um, remember, if somebody spends you know, 20 hours a day or, or 16 hours a day in their wheelchair and they only sleep in their bed at night, this is actually going to be a much better place for those bed bugs to be. So you might be doing your best control efforts on the home, but if that person is leaving for treatment each time you do it and they're leaving with bed bugs and they're bringing them right back in on their wheelchair, then you are you know, not going to get control or eliminate that infestation. And then also when it comes to these areas of the home, those bed bugs are typically going to be in your areas of least disruption. So when we're looking at a bed, when we're inspecting a bed, when you are in a when you're talking about a low level infestation and we'll talk about what that means, we are not going to typically find bed bugs on um, on a pillow or right on top of the sheets. Bed bugs are going to be hiding in areas of least disruption when we are typically doing our inspections. So, you know, during the day, uh, we're moving things around. Those bed bugs are hiding. That's why we need to make sure that we are pulling couch cushions out. We're flipping couches. We're pulling box springs off of beds. And we're not just doing a quick, quick sheet check on top of those beds. This is going to be important. Uh, when we get into talking about no prep and how we actually recommend treatment. So I also talked about active bed bug movement, meaning bed bugs move on their own. It's not just facilitated by humans and by our movement, but what we know is that bed bugs will actually move on their own when we are talking about multifamily housing um, situations. So this was a study that was done out of Rutgers University in New Jersey here in the States. And this study, um, which was done a few years ago, really showed us that bed bugs do move on their own. Prior to this study being done, we thought that bed bugs hung out in those areas of least disruption in the beds or in the couches, and then just came out to feed at night when the host was sleeping or when the host was resting or calmed down and not moving around a whole lot. And what this showed us was that even when a host is present, those bed bugs are moving around. And we don't always know why. You know, if you have a host present, why do you need to move from the bed? So this study was called a mark release recapture study. And what they did was collect bed bugs from apartments. They painted them with different colors of paint. So that's what you see those little starbursts, red, yellow, green, white, and they released them in known places back in those apartments that they came from. So the red, uh, the bed bugs that were painted red were released at the head of the bed, yellow were released at the foot of bed, so on and so forth. And then what they did was put interception devices, as you can see um, with all of these concentric circles, I'll use my pointer here, my laser, um, these are all interception devices. For those of you that are not familiar with monitors or interception devices, I'm going to talk about those in a moment. Um, but they place these all around the apartments to catch bed bug movement and to see if they were moving, where they were moving, uh, was there consistency to how they were moving. And really what they found um, was that bed bugs just move. Even when there are hosts present, when there are two people, you know, living in this unit, those bed bugs, for whatever reason, still decided to move around. So they might be found in a different room um, within 24 hours. And then even um, within the next two weeks, they might move across the hall and to the apartment below. So this is one of the reasons when we talk about inspections, and I'm not going to super get into surrounding unit inspections, but this is why we also want to make sure when we are talking about units that are connected and they have shared walls or shared ceilings, floors, or even the unit right across the hall, we want to make sure we are looking in those surrounding units for a bed bug infestation as well as our so-called problem unit that we were called out for. Now, I talked about, um, you know, where we want to look when it comes to an inspection, but, you know, why are inspections important? Well, for a variety of reasons. First, we need to detect a new problem. As I mentioned, 
fights are not reason enough alone to tell us that um, we need to treat for bed bugs here. We also need to do an inspection to assess the extent of a problem. All bed bug infestations are not created the same. And before we do a treatment, we should be assessing how many we have or a roundabout number of how many we have. Because if we have two bed bugs versus 200 bed bugs, then we're going to want to train, change our treatment methods. We want to do an inspection to evaluate the effectiveness of our control efforts. Um, if we are doing multiple treatments for bed bugs, then we need to be doing inspections on each one of those visits to ensure that our treatments are actually working. You know, if we are coming back each time and our numbers are really not dwindling, then we need to rethink our treatment efforts or might be an instance where we talk to the customer to see if they're doing something to reintroduce those bed bugs, but this is why inspections are so important. And then lastly, to determine when a problem has been er eradicated or help determine when it has been eradicated. You know, how do we know if we've really gotten rid of bed bugs? Most co pest control companies that we work with don't use devices and protocols that help them determine if they've truly gotten rid of the bugs. And they may say, even if you see bugs in a few weeks, you know, that's reintroduction, that's reinfestation, not my problem. Um, you know, I'm going to charge you more money because now you need me to come out and do an inspect a treatment again. But what you know, research has told us is that reintroduction and reinfestation really only happens about five percent of the time when we truly eradicated or eliminated an infestation. Um, so if a customer calls you three weeks later because they found another bed bug or another couple of bed bugs. If you do not have a variety of tools in place to say, I absolutely have gotten rid of your bed bugs, we don't know if that's reintroduction, reinfestation, or did we just not get rid of them in the first place? Was there a cluster of eggs just waiting to hatch that we never got a handle on? So when we're doing our inspections, there's a few things that we are looking for. We're not just looking for bed bugs themselves. One of the first things we're going to be looking out for is fecal spotting. Um, these pictures are great. I love these pictures. Um, but the fecal spotting, as you can see on the mattress lining in that bottom picture, these black dots, fecal spotting is done away from where those bed bugs are hiding. So if we are doing a full inspection, we might find the fecal spotting before we even find those bed bugs. In addition to fecal spotting, we're of course looking for the bugs themselves. Um, we're looking for eggs. Eggs are similar to fecal spotting where bed bugs are going to lay them and maybe go hide somewhere else. Sometimes they're hiding with the eggs. Sometimes they're hiding in a different place, but eggs, fecal spotting, these things are stationary, so they're not moving. Um, it's not like during the day they're going to move or disappear. So these might be some of the first things we look for. And then also cast skins. Bed bugs shed their skin um, when they molt, just like many insects out there, many arthropods out there. And they often leave these cast skins just hanging around before they go back and hide wherever they were hiding. So these are some of the things that we're going to be looking for when we're doing an inspection. The way that we typically recommend doing inspections are going to be first starting with a visual inspection. Now, visual inspections are not going to find new bed bug infestations 100% of the time. They might only find 50 to 70% of those low level infestations. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we need to focus our inspections on areas of least disruption where people are spending a lot of time. There are endless places that bed bugs can hide and you're never gonna find all of them or you know, it's not really gonna be cost effective to spend hours looking for them, especially in cases of low level infestations. Um, That's obviously not to say that visual inspection isn't important and it should really be an integral part of your program or an integral part of your program. But if you don't find anything, it doesn't necessarily mean something isn't there. You know, someone calls you, customer calls, I'm getting bitten, um, super itchy, waking up at night with welts, my kid has welts, you know, whatever it might be, this prompts us to come out and do an inspection. Now, again, 
just because we do this visual inspection doesn't mean there isn't something there. This goes back to being empathetic to our customers. Um, we are not going to find every single low-level infestation when it comes to just using a visual inspection. And again, we need to focus on more than just the tops of mattresses, the tops of couches, the tops of recliners. Bed bugs are going to be hiding in those places of least disruption. Now, that's off also when we talk about treatment, where we want to focus our treatment efforts as well, or where those places that bed bugs are actually hiding. Now, something else that might be an option for you, um, depending on your inspection, depending on how many uh, units or you know whatever it might be that you have to inspect, canine inspections are also um, an option. Now, canine inspections, just like visual inspections, are not 100%. But um, bed bug sniffing dogs are not going to be 100% accurate, but they can be great for those large scale inspection efforts when you want to do a large number of things. And I'm saying things because it might be apartment units, but it might also be something like um, a movie theater. If you think you have bed bugs, you know, going into a movie theater and looking at each one of those seats individually is kind of difficult. So Dogs are great when it comes to those large scale inspections, um, but we also want to recommend, this is just our PSA here, because they are not 100%, you want to make sure that if they are motioning that they have found bed bugs, that they are confirming, that you are confirming those the actual presence of those bed bugs. So have the dogs, you know, show me the bug, we say. Um, or if you can't find it, you doing a visual inspection after the dog has signaled they found bed bugs, this is where monitors and interception devices can be used to confirm the presence of bed bugs, which gets us into talking about monitors. So monitors are, when we're talking about them, also known as interception devices or pitfall traps. These are a variety of different terms we can use when we talk about monitoring. What I'm going to be talking about is going to be these pitfall style interception devices, which intercept bugs away from sleeping and resting areas as they seek a blood meal. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the concept of a pitfall um, trap or um, interception device for bed bugs, bed bugs are able to crawl up the side here this side is going to be textured. Bed bugs aren't great crawlers, so this side is textured. It allows those bed bugs to crawl up and they get to this edge and they fall in and they can't get out. It's very simple and um, it's a very effective way to look for or monitor for bed bug infestation. So why use monitors? If we have visual inspections, we have canines, well, Pitfall traps actually detect more infestations than doing just a visual inspection. So this was an apartment complex that um, had 77 inspections done, and these apartments had 10 or fewer bed bugs present. So super low level infestations, 10 or fewer bed bugs. And this just really goes to show you that when interception devices were used over end of end of visual inspection was done, interception devices found, you know, almost twice as many of those infestations as just a, um, than just a visual inspection alone. This is an under the leg interception device. I'm going to talk about two different kinds. This is an under the leg interception device. This is called a climb up. This is something that you would be able to purchase. This is available to you. So this was a study that was done using under the leg intercept interception devices in 116 units and a visual inspection was done first. So in all of these units, researchers did a visual inspection and they found 746 bed bugs. It's a lot of bed bugs. I was not involved with the study. Pretty happy I wasn't out there counting all of those bed bugs. But they counted those bugs. They put the interception devices under the legs of the beds and couches. And then they came back 10 days later, and in that inner well, so in this well right here, this is what the inner well is, they found 291 bed bugs. So what does that mean? Well, if those bed bugs are found in the inner well, that means those are bugs that were found coming off of the bed. 
So these were bugs that were in the beds, in the couches, and they were trying to make their way off of those pieces of furniture because remember, bed bugs move. And then they found over 1,300 bugs in the outer well. This is possibly more important depending on how you look at things. And this really tells us that those bed bugs were coming from other areas of those units or of those homes to try and get to that host. And this is going to be important when we talk about no prep and when we talk about clutter, because what this really means pretty simply is that those bed bugs were coming from clutter. They were coming from places that we didn't normally do an inspection on and they were trying to get to the host. And then there was a total of over 1600 bugs caught in the monitors between what was in the inner well and what was in the outer well. And really what that number tells you is that adding monitors and or interception devices, I apologize, I use those terms interchangeably, but what this really should show you is that not only do interception devices help you identify infestations earlier, the visual inspections don't find, which is what we saw on the last slide, but what this tells you is they also are super useful as part of a treatment program because what they are doing is catching bugs in between services that your chemicals didn't get to, um, which is really important when we talk about chemicals and resistance to chemicals. This is pretty much a foolproof way. Those bed books fall in, they can't get out. It doesn't matter how resistant they are to a chemical, they're not getting out of an interception device. So they're getting caught in one of those wells and they are possibly living, possibly dead when you get back for your follow-up appointment. But at the end of the day, they're not biting your customer and they are not contributing to a larger infestation because normally as they're moving around, they would, you know, go find somewhere to hide, they'd find a mate, they mate, lay eggs, and just continue that infestation. So using interception devices really helps to stop that infestation. So in addition to the under the leg monitor, um, the climb up that you guys have available to you to use as part of your treatment program or however you choose to use it, there are also uh, freestanding interception devices. This is the Sensei Volcano. This is um, meant to be used a little bit differently than the under the leg interception devices. This is meant uh, to be more discreet. Obviously it's much smaller, helps to blend into the environment. So you might have um, some sensitive areas that you're looking for bed bugs in, whether it's an office building or you know, hospitality. Uh, these are great as part of a proactive monitoring program because you're not moving furniture around. You're putting an interception device to down next to the leg. You are possibly uh, using a lure with it, such as active CR, and you're drawing those bed bugs to the interception device. They're falling into that pitfall trap. And when you come back, Remember, we said those visual inspections are not 100%, no inspection is, but when you come back, you're more likely to have bed bugs in your interception device that maybe you didn't find upon visual inspection. And then lastly, the Sensei Pyramid. Uh, this is a new product that my colleague just came out with earlier this year. This is a glue trap, a pitfall style glue trap meant for bed bugs. We're not talking about roaches, but it does also work for German cockroaches. This is something um, we know the pest control industry, regardless of uh, which country we are in, the pest control industry loves to use glue traps for bed bugs, but bed bugs are pretty, pretty good at getting onto that glue and backing themselves off. So using a pitfall style interception device does the same thing we love in a glue board, but it actually allows it for the bed bug to not be able to back itself off. So we have a variety of benefits of using those monitors for capturing lots of bugs between services, reducing bites on our clients, catching bugs from hard to address clutter, and helping us to identify low level infestations. But at the end of the day, like I said, no detection tool is going to be 100% effective for those super low level infestations. So let's round it out by talking about no prep and treatment. So Transform, formerly known as Bedbug Central, we are not a pest control company. We are a training and education resource for the pest control industry uh, when it comes to bedbugs. 
And we train companies on our no prep methodology because we believe that this is the best way to get rid of bed bugs. So what is no prep? Well, when it comes to a prep sheet, this is this is typical. I pulled this off Google. I don't know if it's anybody's prep sheet on here, um, but I pulled this guy off Google to really just go through and show all of the things that are done or requested when it comes to a typical prep sheet. And, you know, why are those things requested is really our biggest question. As I mentioned at the beginning, bedbugs had a resurgence around 2000. When that resurgence happened, we hadn't seen bedbugs in 40 or 50 years. The industry really didn't know what to do. To be completely honest, we were at a loss and prep seemed like the best option. But We've learned so much in the last two decades that what we need to be doing is getting away from those old school methods of treating and start modernizing what we're doing based on what research has shown us. So when I talk about infestation levels, I've mentioned this a few times when I talk about low versus high. So we like to quantify our infestation levels. And what we know from research done in New Jersey, and other places is that only about 10% of infestations are what we call high or have 100 or more bed bugs. Whoop, went the wrong way. 20% of infestations are moderate, which means they have 21 to 99 bed bugs, which leaves us with the last 70%, which is our majority of infestations actually have 20 or fewer bed bugs. So our biggest question is why do we treat our infestations and do our treatments as though they are one size. And why do we only have a one size fits all approach when it comes to bed bugs? Why is the person that has three bed bugs prepping their home the same as the person that has 300? And when it comes to low level infestations, we know those bugs are going to be predictable. We know they're going to be hiding in areas that people are spending a lot of time and in areas of least disruption. So why are we treating and having people prep, you know, all corners of their home? And then even when we have them prep and, and say our customer actually does a good job, which we know doesn't happen all that often, what did that prep actually miss? I'm sure many of you have seen this before if you've been doing bed bug work. But if my customer preps to the best of their ability and I come in and I'm like, oh, this is great. You did a great job prepping. It doesn't negate the fact that there's still places that those bed bugs are hiding that I still have to treat that prep did absolutely nothing to address. So our no prep approach doesn't mean no cooperation. It doesn't mean we're not asking anybody to do anything. It means as professionals, we are approaching an infestation and we are assessing it, doing a full inspection before having our customers alter or disrupt the infestation. And then we're making site-specific recommendations based on what we see when we're doing a treatment right? We don't want to do one size fits all, have everybody prep everything, but it doesn't mean that you don't go into a house and say, I need you to launder these sheets. I need you to clean this closet out for me next time. But we're making site specific recommendations instead of having customers that are prepping, maybe they're prepping poorly. That never happens. But, you know, people that are thinking they're doing a great job for us. I took all the sheets off the bed for you. Great. Where did you put them? I put them in the closet. Great. So your shoes are now infested with bed bugs. I've seen that before. People think they're helpful. People think they're doing a good job. And what they're actually doing is moving those bed bugs around. So they're disrupting the infestation. They're altering the conditions. They're dispersing the bed bugs because they're actually just moving them around their home as they try to prep. And we as professionals can't always ad properly address infested items because we don't know where they are because people have moved them. Like I mentioned that that closet example, without doing a full inspection and without talking to your customer, you might have this ongoing infestation that is maybe it's low level and it continues little by little each week. And we can't figure out why. Well, it's because when you ask them to prep, they move something, maybe a duffel from underneath of the bed, um, you know, a, a bag, suitcase, whatever it is. They moved it from under the bed and put it in a closet, and that was actually infested. And we haven't addressed that closet in our treatment or inspection. So those bed bugs are slowly just leaving that suitcase, coming to feed, going back to the suitcase, and our treatment efforts are doing nothing. 
93% of bed bugs are going to be found within those sleeping areas. This is going to typically be our first area of infestation. This is where most bed bugs are going to be found in that primary resting areas. So we wanna focus our treatments on beds, couches, those high risk areas. And then when it comes to monitors, if we have used them as part of our treatment program, we can use those to address bugs that we missed in our treatment. Those bugs that did randomly move, that are randomly in the closet or randomly one in a dresser because they're going to need to make their way back to the host. It all comes back to that biology of the bed bug. They need to make their way back to the host. They need to get that blood meal. So using monitors and using residual treatments, eventually that bed bug will cross that treatment, get caught in that monitor, and it's not our problem anymore. So when it comes to treatment, like I mentioned, we are not a pest control company. I'm not here to tell you all of these different chemicals to use. Um, I also know over there, you guys are kind of limited when it comes to your chemical usage. But what I do want to tell you as a professional, obviously liquid residuals are important, but how do we combat resistance of bed bugs to pesticides? So when it comes to treating, we want to make sure we're doing targeted treatments, uh, treating places where we know bed bugs are or where they're going to be. Um, obviously, you want to follow the label directions when it comes to where you actually apply them, but remember where your bed bug is and where it wants to be when it comes to that application. Different modes of action. You might be um, using the same or very similar active ingredients because that's what you have, but using different modes of action for those active ingredients will you know, also help to combat resistance and help get at the bed bug at different, from different areas. And then make sure you're rotating out your chemicals. Using the same chemical week by week by week, that is only gonna help build that resistance. Dust, we recommend in addition to liquid residuals, using dust, um, you guys use DE, for cracks and crevices. We obviously don't wanna be spraying it everywhere uh, or putting it everywhere. We don't want clouds of dust. We know there's some behavioral resistance in bed bugs when it comes to using dust, but we do want to use dust in cracks and crevices in a targeted manner because it does work great against bed bugs. Now, we're also all about non-chemical treatments. One of those is going to be using a vacuum. Get rid of large numbers of bugs in a really short period of time. It will also eliminate those caskins that they've left behind, which actually can be a place for bed bugs to hide. So smaller nymphs, first instar nymphs, will hide in those discarded caskins of the older bed bugs. So we want to get rid of all of those because they just make for a uh, new hiding place for bed bugs. We also super recommend the use of steam. Steam is a non-chemical treatment. It penetrates really well into all different types of furniture. It also is something that kills eggs. Eggs are really difficult when it comes to bed bugs. Um, chemicals don't work well, really well for them. Vacuums are not gonna be able to really vacuum eggs off of furniture. This is where steam is going to come into play. It's gonna kill those bugs that are hiding below an area, um, but it's also going to kill those eggs. And this little video. Encasements, um, take that complicated box spring out of the equation. We can use encasements proactively to prevent an infestation of that area, but as part of a treatment program, they also help us when it comes to that inspection. Uh, you know, inspecting an encasement that looks like this is going to be a lot easier than inspecting a box spring time and time again when we keep going back for those treatments. And then interception devices as part of a complete program, whether it's an under the leg monitor, a freestanding monitor, they all have their different places, but obviously we recommend using these to catch those bugs in between treatments that our chemicals are not getting. Laundering, high heat kills bed bugs. So going in, doing a treatment, um, identifying what people need to help us out with. Laundering is gonna be something that our customers can still do when it comes to their sheets, maybe infested clothes or other things that we can even just throw in a dryer to kill those bed bugs and kill those eggs. So to round it out, some key messaging, bed bugs are predictable. 
all infestations should not be treated the same. Prepping for bed bugs can actually make that infestation harder to treat. We know that bed bugs will move on their own. This is also a key reason for inspecting on each one of those treatments that you do to identify any bed bug movement that's happened. Just because in the main bedroom, that's where we found bed bugs on treatment one, doesn't mean that on treatment two, they are uh, they didn't move to a new room. And we recommend using a variety of tools for detection and treatment. And then just some resources that we have, YouTube, online, Facebook, Instagram, you know, the whole, the whole shebang. And I don't know. My mouse, I lost my mouse, Natalie. But um, thank you everyone um, for this, for inviting me to come and speak. And I hope you have some questions. Absolutely. Fantastic, Sarah. Um, I, I can just confirm I've never put a bed bug on me to feed from just to see what happens. Uh, I, I don't think a lot of our uh, viewers have either, but it'd be interesting to see if they have. Um, but yeah, 14 days, you said it took it for that bite to, to yeah, come about, out. About 12 days. So that also when it comes to, you know, if you're doing a treatment and your customer says, I'm still getting bit, they might also just have a delayed reaction. Um, so, you know, all these things to think about. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to set confirmation. Maybe uh, I can convince one of our members to go and uh, test it out, see what happens. <laughs> but that's great. So um, we've got we've got like 10 questions in there. We're, we're not going to be able to get to them all, but I just um, have been having a look through and quite a common question um, I thought I'd get out there to you is that those traps that you were talking about, are they all available in the UK? Do you know? Yes. Yeah, so the traps that I went over specifically, um, the climb ups, the I'm going to that slide, the climb ups, the volcano and the pyramid are all available in the UK. Um, you would just go to your kill drum rep and talk to whoever he or she is, mm -hmm. and uh, they'll be able to point you in the direction of, you know, which one you want, which one you're interested in, which one you want to try out. Yeah, great. We say that, you know, talk to their suppliers and and, and see what they've got. And uh, if mm -hmm. they haven't got what they want, maybe they can they can source it for them. So mm -hmm. that's um, that's great. Another uh, there's a few questions about uh, like heat treatment and mm -hmm. dogs and what your thoughts are on them. But I know you, you covered uh, dogs a little bit there, but more about heat treatment. Do you is it something you use a lot in America or? So heat treatment um, is going to be very not very it's kind of regional so in certain areas of the country in the in the states such as the south and the west like california uh arizona the hotter states they use heat and fumigation pretty often uh, mm -hmm. for bed bugs because they're also doing a lot of termite treatments but heat has more value for them in the northeast where i am in jersey um and in the northern part of the country heat has kind of fallen off a bit over the years because it is so difficult um, to manage from both a personnel treatment, you know, if you're a personnel perspective, if you're doing a heat treatment, that is, you know, typically eight hours that your guy is, you know, not there, um, or your girl, if that's your technician. Mm -hmm. And by not there, I mean, they're not doing any other work, they just have to sit and monitor that heat treatment. And then maybe there's a second person there, so that you have two people on that. So a lot of people over the last few years have gotten away from heat, but there are still plenty of companies that if you have, say, really bad infestation, um, companies that will recommend a heat treatment, because sometimes that's really the best way to go from a non-traditional uh, aspect is to is to go the heat route. Um, mm -hmm. But heat works when it's done well, when I've also been on treatments when it was done poorly, and we have to, you know, kind of do the follow up. So, mm -hmm. um, and then bed, uh, bed bug, or canine dogs, they canine dogs, canine inspections. <laughs> um, canine inspections are great when you have a lot of things that you want to inspect. So maybe you're doing um, apartments and you have, you know, we have high rises over here, lots and lots of units, and you have that property manager that wants them all, all inspected. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a hard task to ask for uh, people because obviously we cost a lot more money and it takes us longer to go through and inspect and flip mattresses and couches and all that. But that might be a case where you bring in a canine and have them go through and do um, an inspection of mm -hmm. the entire unit. Or like I said, movie theater, office buildings, those are great places for dogs. 
Yeah, great. Well, yeah, we have that a lot in the UK. We've got, you know, large hotels that, you know, are doing Mm -hmm. a proactive or trying to do as much proactive as they can. And, you know, they'll send the dogs in, so Mm -hmm. to speak. Um, But like you say, it's not always, you know, 100%, but it it depends on the dog's trained, doesn't it? And what their processes are. And we've got a lot of animal welfare legislation in this country as well. So, you know, there's certain rest periods they have to have and things like Mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, it's certainly for the experts, isn't it? Um, Yes. Dogs and and heat treatments, you know, because they're both very uh, involved well great Sarah listen I really appreciate that it's um 11 o'clock now however well, there are some questions hanging around in our Q&A section you you, you can see the button can't you there yes, um can. and you can you can type the answer in are you okay to do that for us just to uh, go through yeah. the questions and and type some bits in there so that you know um everyone can can get the answers from me that would be great yep I can handle that Absolutely. And there's a few comments in there about how early it is for you and how appreciative we are. So, um, yeah, um, it's uh, really appreciate you're here with us today. Well, we appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Sarah. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Take care now. Right. Fantastic, everyone. Thank you. So uh, we're only running a couple of minutes late, but that was absolutely worth it. Uh, you know, bed bugs is a massive subject to cover as much as Sarah did in those uh, 45, 50 minutes was was just amazing. And um, I'm sure there's lots more questions. Um, and of course, you know, speak to us. We can communicate anything that you need. But Sarah will answer some of those questions, type them out in the Q&A section. But for now, I think it's time for a little break, um, uh, get a coffee, have a stretch, and we'll see you all back here in about, yeah, five minutes. I think five past 11 would be great. Um, I know we've got five minutes less than we normally would, but be fantastic if you could uh, move those feet a little quicker. All right, great. We'll see you soon, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> 